Happy Wednesday, everyone. Today, I'm really looking forward to talking to you about the funeral oration of Pericles, one of the most foundational speeches in Western democracy and a real lens into the way that Pericles and other Athenians of his generation saw the relationship between the radical democracy of Athens and the empire which they had built for themselves in the period between the end of the Persian War and the plague. I have heard uh, your feedback loud and clear that we need some shorter lectures, a little bit punchier, a little bit more engaging. So um, this is my first experiment in trying to squeeze down some big ideas into about 20 direct minutes of content. So uh, let's keep this train moving. We'll dive right in. There are going to be towards the end of this lecture a number of snippets of the text from the reading. So feel free to either open perusal or to um, find the posted slides on Blackboard so that you can follow right along. Awesome. Okay, let's do a quick recap of what uh, I covered last lecture. Last lecture, I really emphasized that the Delian League and the Athenian Empire were not built in a day. Rather, kind of like a stepladder from generation to generation, each new group of Athenian leadership made their own improvements and contributions to assembling um, Athens' rather short-lived empire uh, across the Greek Mediterranean. And those leaders, uh, let me zoom in here, um, I think each of them, if we had sat down and asked, would have responded that building an empire requires not just might, it requires a mindset. This seems like a very President Kubain idea, right? You have to have the right mindset in order to achieve greatness. For Themistocles, that mindset was about finances. I have him saying here, empire costs money, right? That you've, you've got to somehow convince Athenian citizens that it's worthwhile to invest uh, the cash that will be required to build 200 plus triremes, warships, in order to go conquer the world. For Kimon, whom we've generally had a lot of respect for, I imagine someone like Kimon saying, look, if you're going to build an empire, sometimes it's going to take sweat and blood. You're going to have to break a few kneecaps. Islands like Naxos and Thassos may not like your rules or your big ideas, uh, but you've got to make your will happen and not give in to their complaints. And for Pericles, and we'll see more of this today, I can imagine someone him like him saying, the mindset for empire is being willing and not shy to take what you have truly earned. The Athens didn't build an empire in order uh, you know, to, to serve a great humanitarian mission. We built an empire so that we could benefit Athenians first and foremost. So for each of these men, but especially for Pericles, keeping Athens as the primary beneficiary of the Delian League and the Athenian Empire was the objective. Now today, as we turn to the funeral oration, we're going to see more of that imperial mindset and specifically how Pericles reflects on his own uh, trajectory as a leader and how he wants Athenians to be thinking about the future as they head into the Peloponnesian War. Let me start first by trying to define what is a funerary oration or a funeral oration. Well, Pericles' funeral oration was just one of many. It was traditional in wartime in Athens, at least once a year for the head general, the polemarch, to deliver an oration to honor the war dead. Now, of course, this speech is meant for the dead, but it's also meant for the families of the dead, the wives, the fathers, the children of dead soldiers. And so because this speech uh, had was done so frequently during wartime, it has a certain structure to it. You would have expected uh, the speaker to honor the dead, maybe to mention a memorable battle or two, call out a few of the best known soldiers. But as we're going to see today, Pericles' oration is much more about Athens and the project of Athens rather than any specific moments from the war itself. In order to get a, a better understanding still of exactly what the funerary oration might have meant to the Athenians, I think it's helpful to compare it somewhat to the Gettysburg Address. Because like the Gettysburg Address, the funeral oration of Pericles is about trying to define what the great Athenian project is. And if you read the opening lines of the Gettysburg Address, you also see 
President Lincoln trying to explain what was at stake in the great American experiment. Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought on this continent a new nation conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Now we are engaged in a great civil war, testing whether that nation or any nation so conceived or de and dedicated can long endure. Here, Lincoln is emphasizing that our founding fathers from 1776 wanted for this nation liberty and equality, and that the Civil War is kind of the ultimate test of that value system, right? Can the dream of a truly equal nation hold up? And of course, today we know it did. Not a perfect nation. We still have a long ways to go in terms of equality, but uh, that the dream of our founding fathers for the United States as a place of liberty and justice for all was functionally possible. So if you're trying to think like, why is the funeral oration so important? Just think Gettysburg Address, right? They're equally symbolic in their ability to encapsulate what Athens and America are all about. Okay, what's my big argument for you today? My big argument is that in Pericles' funerary oration, he takes a radical step of claiming that Athens is not just a place or a people, but it is an idea a shining beacon of idea for the rest of the Greek world about what Greece could be if they embraced the value system of the Athenians. Uh, just so I can make sure that that's really drilled into place, I'll read it again, my big idea. To grieving Athenians, Pericles is trying to define Athens, not as a place, not as a people, but as an unprecedented experiment in liberty and empire. Now, why are liberty and empire important? Well, in a way, it's because liberty and empire are somewhat opposed to each other, right? Liberty is the idea that we all get to do what we want to pursue what we desire. But empire is the idea of one central place controlling other territories outside of it. And so there's a sort of paradox here, right? How is it the world's most inclusive democracy could try to control the rest of the world? Pericles is perfectly aware of that tension, and in his speech, he will try to offer some reasons for why Athens deserves the leadership position that it has won for itself, sometimes through persuasion, but also sometimes through violence. Okay, um, before we look at the texts themselves, uh, I wanna offer a little bit of historical context. When was the speech? Where and about Pericles' career is it happening? So the funeral oration of Pericles takes place in the year 431, or rather the winter between 431 and 430, which is the traditional time when the oration for the dead is given. It's significant because this speech is given in, after the very first year of war with the Spartans in the Peloponnesian War. So for years, Athens and Sparta have been trying not to fight with each other, but this is the first time they've really gone fully head to head since the generation of Cimon. And so Pericles knows when he is speaking to the Athenians that kind of like us facing down the coronavirus, they know that this isn't gonna be an easy, it's gonna be a long haul. And this generation of young men who just died in war are only the first of many. So you have to keep that in mind. Pericles' speech has to be motivational, right? He's, he's performing for people who um, know that there's a long way to go ahead. Now, in terms of Pericles' own career trajectory, this speech comes really right at the end. Pericles' career had really gotten started almost 30 years prior, a little more than 30 years prior. 464 is sort of the fall of Cimon with the Helot Revolt. Through the 460s and the 450s, Pericles began to make a name for himself as a populist leader. And then now here on the back end, the 440s to 431, we're in the war years, right? Pericles had just been building this big, beautiful Acropolis for himself using Delian League money. But as we head into the 430s and 429, tensions between Sparta and Athens erupt. And it's funny, this funeral oration was given by Pericles to the war dead. He had no way of knowing, of course, that within a year he himself would be dead from the plague. So in a strange way, Pericles' funeral oration could also be read as 
maybe his last message to the Athenians, even though he certainly didn't intend it that way. But Thucydides knew, Thucydides, the historian who preserves the speech, definitely knew that this was going to be a significant speech because Pericles didn't really live long enough to see it um, fully fulfilled. And speaking of Thucydides, that brings me to one last point of context I want to share with you, which is the problem of Thucydides, the Thucydides question. Now, the speech uh, you can see in my slide, I've done, I've like put Thucydides' face on Pericles with Thucydides' book right next to him. And that's because uh, the only way we have the copy of this speech is because of the historian Thucydides. We don't have any personal handwritten texts from Pericles himself, not even letters. We have no idea what he wrote word for word. This raises a number of difficult questions, kind of like the relationship between Plato and Socrates. When we read this funeral oration, how much is Pericles and how much is Thucydides? Is Thucydides trying to be really accurate? Is that his goal? Or is he trying to write a speech that he thinks the Athenians need to hear? Or is he maybe even trying to make Pericles look good or bad? I don't have an answer for you. These are the sorts of things that historians go toe to toe on all the time, right? How accurate or what was maybe the subliminal messaging in Thucydides' version of the funeral oration. For our purposes though, I think we should take it as, as accurate as we're gonna get a picture into Thucydides' brain. Okay. We're about to look at some texts and passages that I want to share with you, really highlight as the key points in the funeral oration. Uh, and I'd like to organize them by emphasizing that although there, we could spend you know, a whole week on just the funeral oration, there's three main themes that come out of this speech that I want you to be paying attention to. And maybe you can use in, a, in your last um, research paper if indeed you decide to write on the topic of empire. Okay, those themes. Have a look at them real quick. Beautiful. We're going to start in order. The first idea is one you've probably heard before, which is the idea of like deeds are greater than words. And what I mean by this is that for Pericles, the achievements of the young Athenian soldiers who died for their city really can't be described in human language nor can the many great things that Athens has done prior to this. After looking at three passages on that theme, we'll turn to the next one, which is a pretty bold, maybe even arrogant statement, which is that Athens deserves, has won the right to be the role model for the rest of the Greeks. Again, that seems pretty bold, maybe even controversial, but Pericles will provide evidence. And then lastly, and we would certainly expect this in a funeral oration, the idea that the best thing you can do for your city uh, is to one day perhaps give your life for it. And that giving your life for your city state is the greatest act of immortality and patriotism that any human being could ever hope to achieve. All right, so we're about to look at uh, the first passage, this one right here. It comes from the very opening of the funeral oration. And in this passage, Pericles begins in a kind of unusual way. As I'm going to show you in just a second, he sort of begins by saying, I'm not even sure I should be giving this speech. I'm not even sure that anyone should be giving this speech. I'm going to read it here. I could have wished that the reputations of many brave men were not to be imperiled, meaning endangered, in the mouth of a single individual to stand or fall according as he spoke well or ill. Now that line is pretty powerful here. Have a look, right? I wish that the reputations of many brave men didn't just rest on whether or not I spoke well or ill about them. Now maybe Pericles is just being modest, but I think another thing Pericles might be pointing to in this passage is that Athens is so obsessed with public speaking and oratory but maybe it's not such a good thing. Maybe there are some things oratory can't cover or can't speak to. And the reason Pericles thinks maybe oratory will fall short is what he says next. He says, look, it's pretty hard to convince your listeners that you're speaking the truth. The friends of the dead, i.e. who knows everything about this person and, and what happened to them, they will um, think 
some point has not been set forth with that fullness which he which which ugh, which he wishes and knows it to deserve i.e your best friend of a war veteran is going to say you left something out you didn't capture it all and then in the next part he says he who is a stranger to the matter may be led to envy to suspect exaggeration if he hears anything above his own nature meaning if you didn't know any of the war dead and i really praise them in huge terms you'll think I'm making it up just to be nice. So in some ways with public oratory, with trying to speak a memorial for the war dead, it's an impossible task right from the get go. There's no way to really capture fully what happened uh, in such a way that won't make some people think you're blowing smoke. And so that's sort of count number one that um, why words can't capture deeds. In the next passage I'm going to show you, Pericles goes even further and he says, not only can I, an orator, not do it, I don't even think a great poet like Homer could or should do it. As he says here, far from needing a Homer for our eulogist, meaning someone who says nice things, or other of his craft whose verses might charm for a moment, I'm going to jump down, we have forced every sea and land to be the highway of our daring and everywhere, whether for evil or for good, have left imperishable monuments behind us. Now, in order to understand how mind-blowing this idea is, I have to reiterate to you, Homer is, for the Greeks, almost biblical in stature. He was read at religious ceremonies. Every Greek child would have grown up memorizing passages from Homer. So for Pericles to come out and say, I don't think we need a poet. We don't need a Homer for our generation. The things that our young men have done will be remembered just in and of themselves, right? They are monuments without poetry. Remarkable. In this last passage on the theme of words and not deeds, Pericles is going to build on the logic of the Homer passage to say not only do men not need a poet, they don't even need gravestones. Uh, I'm going to jump here to section number three, which is probably one of my favorite lines. Heroes have the whole earth for their tomb, and in lands far from their own where the column with its epitaph declares it, there is enshrined in every breast a record unwritten with no monument to preserve it except that of the heart. Wow. Man, this always makes me want to like I don't know, go join the West Wing and write speeches for politics. But ultimately, you, you grasp what he's saying here, that true heroes, true people who put their lives on the line don't need monuments because what they have done lives on in us. They live in our hearts and they live in the memories of every person that they touched, whether for good or for evil, evil if you're their enemy potentially. Now, this collection of things that Pericles says we don't need, we don't need a public orator, we don't need a homer, we don't need a tombstone, all of these things might seem a little random to you, but I actually think they add up to something pretty big. And this is the idea that Pericles is taking all of the things that have traditionally been associated with Athenian culture and saying, we actually don't need any of them. They're superfluous. They're not the real Athens, right? Homer, reading Homer, performing poetry, a culture based on poetry. That's Athens. We don't need a Homer. Sophists, people who will train you to speak in public eloquently. We don't need those guys either, right? Um, actions speak louder than words. And even monuments. You have to remember Pericles has just spent the past 20 years building up the Acropolis. And here he's saying, I don't actually think we need monuments or tombstones to remember our dead. This, all of this as a package is a pretty deft rhetorical move in which Pericles is emphasizing that Athens is about to have some hard times we're going to war with Sparta. We may not have money for festivals, for sophists, for great temples, but that's okay, people, because those aren't the things that actually make us great. And in now the, the second section of his speech, I want to now change gears to our next topic. Pericles is going to list all of the immaterial things that do make Athens great, right? That even in wartime, 
even in times of poverty, hardship, even plague, these things cannot be destroyed by Spartan soldiers. Okay, the second section uh, that we're now tying into this, this theme is the idea that Athens is a beacon or a model for the rest of the Greek world. Athens is unique, Athens is great because of a few key qualities that have nothing to do with poets or culture or, or, or temples or anything like that. The first thing that Pericles thinks makes Athens truly unique is its democracy. In this passage, Pericles points out that our constitution does not copy the laws of neighboring states. We are a pattern to others rather than imitators ourselves, meaning other places want to be like us. We don't base our government on anybody else. Here he says a little bit further, uh, if we look to the laws, meaning if we have a look at our laws, they give justice to everybody. If we look at our social standing, advancement in public life falls to reputation for capacity and class doesn't matter. Poverty doesn't bar the way. If a man can serve the state, he is not hindered by the obscurity of his condition. Everybody gets a bite at government, no matter how poor they are, no matter what class they're from, that, he says, is the heart of Athenian democracy, this big hug inclusivity. I can hear my Thrasybulans like cheering, like, yeah, that we're all about that. And then my Pericleans probably remember like, but wait a minute, didn't he say that only full-blooded citizens can be citizens? Yes, trust me, we're going to get to that. So reason number one that makes Athens so unique and incredible that the Spartan government can't, control, uh, can't destroy, uh, it's democracy. Reason number two is all about military, but it's not what you think. Pericles isn't interested in ticking off all the great battles that Athens has won. Instead, he wants to talk about foreign policy and diplomacy. Here he says, if we turn to our military policy, there also we differ from our antagonists, our enemies. We throw open our city to the world and never by alien acts exclude foreigners from any opportunity of learning or observing, right? That's pretty, um, that's a pretty careful statement here. Pericles is on the one hand saying, we are very open. We will welcome medics. Anybody who wants to come to Athens and live here in Athens can, right? We create pathways of inclusion. But at that same time, look at that line one more time. He says, um, we never by alien acts exclude foreigners from any opportunity of learning or observing. That's not the same as saying we let anybody become an Athenian. Pericles is willing to let people come and observe how Athens works, but not necessarily hand them the keys to the kingdom. That's what makes a Periclean different from a Thrasybulan. Okay, so we have a unique democracy, a unique foreign policy that allows foreigners to come. And really the crux of all of this that Pericles is building up to is considered the most famous part of his speech in which he calls Athens the school of Hellas. Here he says, in short, I say that as, as a city, we are the school of Hellas and Hellas is just a fancy word for Greece. While I doubt if the world can produce a man who where he has only himself to depend on is equal to so many emergencies and graced by so happy a versatility as the Athenian. And that this is no mere boast thrown out for the occasion, but plain matter of fact is proved by the power of state acquired by these habits. Athens alone of her contemporaries is found when tested to be greater than her reputation. This is a remarkable and bold claim from Pericles because he says, we are going to be the teachers of the rest of Greece. We are going to show them how things are done. And when the pedal hits the metal, there is nobody you want in your camp more than an Athenian. And furthermore, that this is why we have built the empire we have is proved by the power of the state acquired by these habits, right? Athens is the only city in the Greek world that rose to the occasion to be better than its reputation. 
This is a pretty masterful work of oratory because in essence, Pericles offers it as the justification for Athens' empire. We deserve to lead the world because we are superior in every category. And you're never gonna find anyone who's happier, more versatile and more brave than an Athenian young man, right? Um, now, certainly the Spartans would disagree with that, probably many city-states and the Greek world, but that doesn't matter if Pericles can persuade his fellow Athenians that they are inheritors of a sort of manifest destiny. Now, I'd like to close by looking at two last passages which really drill home this idea that giving your life for your city is the most patriotic act. And furthermore, Pericles will say, I am not going to comfort you, O families of the dead. I'm, I'm not going to give you my condolences. I'm not sorry that they died. All I will offer you is the comfort of knowing that they achieved greatness by their actions. And in so doing there, Pericles is offering inspiration more than he is trying to offer any sort of apology. So I picked out these two passages. How on earth do you speak to the dead? Well, first you praise the dead as brave young men. Uh, let's start with the top passage. Thus choosing to die resisting rather than to live submitting, they fled only from dishonor, but met danger face to face. And after one brief moment while at the summit of their fortune, left behind them not their fear, but their glory. So died these men as became Athenians, right? That for Pericles is the very definition of Athenian. And it's not merely like the Spartans to be brave and to never back down, but that that guiding ethos that it is better to be free, it is better, better to die standing and defending your freedom and your democracy than to submit to any other form of government. That truly is what distinguishes and justifies Athenian leadership. And then furthermore, in the next passage, he begins to give instructions for what the living Athenians, what should the survivors do? Comfort, therefore, not condolence, is what I have to offer the parents of the dead who may be here. Numberless are the chances to which the life of man is subject, meaning we could all die in a hundred million ways. But fortunate indeed are they who draw for their lot a death so glorious as that which has caused you mourning. Meaning, if we're all going to die somehow, at the very least, your children left you proud of the way they died that they died um, on behalf of their city. And I don't think it's an accident that he uses the word drawing lots because of that, that's how Athenians pick their political leaders as well. It's this notion of fortune, of randomness, and being willing to accept the sort of odds, whatever, whether or not they are in your favor. And that is Pericles' message. Don't give up. Your sons died for a cause. Stay the course. We have many years of warfare ahead of us with the Spartans. It will be worth it to defend our freedom and to defend our empire. So my big takeaway here for you today, and hey, look, I got it done right under 30 minutes. Athens has created a government and a society unlike any other of the past or the Greek present. And Pericles is perfectly comfortable with the idea that protecting this unique experiment in liberty and tyranny might demand just about everything from the Athenians, even their lives. So if you too are gonna make the argument that empire is worth it, you're gonna to have to channel your inner Pericles in order to spell out for families that death is not the ultimate penalty, it is the sacrifice for what it takes to live in a city-state like Athens. All right, have a good one, guys. I will see you after Easter break.